Mr. President, up here! I voted for you! Wait a minute. That guy on the grassy knoll's got a gun. He's gonna shoot the president. Holy smokes, I've gotta do something. All right, Lee. Time to become an American hero. <laughs> Darkmyths.org and the Opus Media Group proudly present to you the Lone Gunman Podcast, featuring your host, Rob Clark, where research comes to shine and myths come to die. Stay tuned. Be right there. compelling pieces of evidence linking Johnson with the assassination is through his henchman Malcolm Wallace, the convicted killer of Douglas Kinzer. In the hours following the assassination, on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building by the southeast corner window, the Dallas police discovered an unidentified fingerprint. Nathan Darby is one of the most experienced fingerprint experts in the United States with 35 years service in the US military and the city of Austin Police Department. I didn't know where it came from. And oh, a week or 10 days later, I called the party and said it brought it over and said, well, it's a match. The finger that made the ink print also made the latent. And we called that a match or identified. And there was no question about it. it, it they matched. When he was done, he had a 34-point match. That's a slam dunk. It can't miss. It doesn't get any better than that. You, you give me a 34-point match on any case in the United States, I'll take it to court and win. The inked and the latent print was Malcolm Wallace's left little finger without a reasonable doubt. I don't know why they couldn't say that, or say that the thing didn't match. It did match. There's no question about it. I, 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 my experience, I've just had too much experience. I know what I'm talking about. I'm positive. No question about it. My dying declaration, if I was to drop dead right now, they match. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show. This is the Lone Gummin Podcast, episode number 127 got a great show for you today and we're celebrating something here today and whenever I celebrate something I always like to invite an old friend of mine because we started this thing together that's right folks the inevitable Doug Campbell joins me the host of the Dallas Action Podcast how are you doing Doug Hello, my friend Rob. What's up, buddy? What's up? And a milestone it is. And let me be the first to uh, congratulate you on that awesome milestone. It's a very cool thing. It's yes. a very cool thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, what we're celebrating here awesome. is 100,000 downloads and listens to the Lone Gummin Podcast. And it wasn't very long, Doug, that we were just celebrating 50,000 here you know, a couple months ago. So I don't know what the hell is going on. Like, but It was like back in May. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like it took us, took me, you know, almost two years to get to fifty thousand, <laughs> and then it, in like six well, months we're we doubled it. it. I, I, here's how I look at it, with uh, as far as my show goes, that if people thought they were going to get the same old thing, they wouldn't keep coming back and listening. And that's a good thing, and that 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 speaks volumes, I think, about about your show. Absolutely. If, you know, if, if people were going to get the same old thing over and over again, or they thought they would, they wouldn't. They wouldn't come back. I'm that way, and I yeah. listen to a lot of. You know, I'm a, I'm a podcast listener. Um, you know, to a bunch of them uh, across the board, and uh, different subjects. And uh, it's going to be the same old thing. I'm not going to go back. You know. Yeah. Well, I'm going to I'm going to title this one something different because actually this episode is going to be a little bit of the same old thing that we talked about last week, but. We're going to bring up a, a different view because, of course, last week, Doug, I had on Fred James, who is of the Lone Nut Persuasion. So 
And recently, I've along that persuasion, if I, if I understand correctly. That is correctly within the past couple of years. Uh, he is a, a recent convert to the dark side. Um, just kidding, Fred, if you're listening out there. Um, but no, seriously, now, the only reason I had Fred on my show is because he had done some good research and brought up some good points about the babushka lady or alleged babushka lady, Beverly Oliver. And whatever side of the fence you might be on, whether you're on the lone nut side or you're on the conspiracy side, it's, it's, you know, it's, it does, it does really no good to, to, you know, muddy the waters with these people like Judith Baker and Beverly Oliver, who, look, whether we like it or not, people lap this stuff up. People believe them. That's why she's still at conferences. Okay, she's doing two conferences this year, and she's a conference rat. She, she she's at every conference, or at some conference every year, you know, or at least one of them, if not both. Um, you know, apparently from people that have met her in person, she seems to be a very genuine, nice person. But as Doug can tell you, we met Judith Baker in person. She seems to be a very nice person in person, uh, very congenial. But <laughs> Nothing she says is true, which is applies also to what we're saying here about Beverly Oliver. Um, you know, she is a really nice, uh, nice lady. Yeah, Judith Baker is very polite, very, uh, uh, very sweet. She, uh, I think the night, the, the night you and I met her at the conference, uh, she, she signed a, uh, a, a, a book, gave me a book, and drew a picture of me, like a little doodle, like a little, uh, uh. Well, that's not hard to do. Like draw. A, that's not hard to draw a little stick figure with long hair. I mean, oh no, 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 no! <laughs> it's, it's pretty easy. Yeah, you just draw. You just draw an upside down mop and roll with it. You know. Yeah. Well, it's you got some. You got some free Judith Baker art. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I have it in a book. I do. Yeah, and and of course, the show last week spurned. All kinds of discussion online. I mean, I've been attacked from both sides of the fence. You know, people that are pissed off just because I had Fred on the show. People that are pissed off because I'm 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 down in the Beverly Oliver's claims. Um, I'm catching it from both sides, but you know, I I, I don't know how much simpler to put this. You know, if if people need to hold these folks a little bit more accountable when it comes to so-called evidence. And when you make a lot of claims like this, and believe me, her she, what Beverly Oliver's story has done over the years has changed and has grown much like Madeline Brown's attendees to the Murchison party. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You're talking, you're talking about like with Ruby's Club? Yeah. 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 That's, that's true. I, uh, I don't know, man. I've got kind of a different view on on Beverly Oliver and her um, her claims, I um, I kind of wonder why. Um, you know, I don't know if she could have been the Babushka lady, and she might not have been the Babushka lady. You know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I know that you got to start with credibility, and um, you know, well, 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 is this person believable? And when she showed the Knicks film, <laughs> that's the one red flag for me. Yeah. And said, hey, look, here's my long lost film. And, you know, who among us doesn't know the Knicks film on site? You know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah. a, a very unique film from a unique perspective. And, well, like Fred said, you know, they, they had stabilized the film and straightened it up. But and, and change the aspect ratio a little bit to heighten to heighten you know to heighten the film to give it a different aspect ratio, but still very identifiable at least the first time I saw it as the next film. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And um, you know, it's uh, I talked. I actually talked to um, the other day. I was talking to Gail Nick Gail Nick Jackson, and um, this came up. And she gave me the name. It was some uh, European journalist brought the film to Beverly Oliver and said, hey, look, I found your film. <laughs> and she said, it turns out to be the next film. And she just kind of dropped it out. And uh, apparently, uh, from what I understand from Gail, and 
said, look, here's my film. And, and, and she had a public viewing. And Gail told me that, that she, con- she confronted Beverly Oliver. Hey, what's going on? Why are you showing my grandfather's film and claiming it's yours? And she said, well, it is mine. And uh, Gail said, no, it's not. It's the Knicks film. And, and Beverly Oliver said, well, he told me it was mine. <laughs> you know, Gail, uh, uh, she she made the point with me that, um, well, who's not going to recognize the film they shot? And, and and my point was, more importantly, with with this crowd, who did they think they were going to fool? Yeah, you know, it's it's whether whether or not she did fall for it, whether or not he hornswoggled her, is not the point. Somebody wanted to fool somebody, and 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 were they really that dim to think that was going to fool this crowd? You know, I, and, and when it comes to believe their story about I saw Oswald at Ruby's thing and I'm the Babushka lady and this and that, you know, it's like the Brian Williams thing, you know. Um, he was a respected um, news anchor until he got caught in that big lie. And that's why he's no longer that news anchor because all of his credibility went out the window because he got caught in a big, giant, honking, stinging lie. And, you know, look at Dan Rather. Um, the, 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 the presidential election where he got caught reporting fake documents that <laughs> pertain to George W. Bush's National Guard Service, right? Texas yeah. Air Guard Service or something like that. They were fake documents. And he got busted. And his excuse was, well, we knew they were fake, but we, in our minds, the stuff that was in them reflected what we believed to be the truth. And I'm going, do what? And that's kind of the same thing as, well, this European guy I've never met told me it's the film I shot. And where's Dan Rather today? Well, the last I saw, I saw a big commercial for his, his upcoming TV show. It's his big exclusive interview on the Wii Network with Michael Bublé. That's where Dan Rather is today. <laughs> because he got caught in a big stinking honking lie. And that's kind of the way I am with Beverly Oliver. Is she the Babushka lady? I don't know. But, you know, as far as Oswald being seen in Ruby's Club, um, I do believe in the possibility, the absolute, absolute 100% possibility that Oswald and Ruby knew each other. I'm just not going to take her word for it. I'll get that confirmation to my own satisfaction from somebody else, because no matter whether or not she's the babushka lady, uh, uh, her she doesn't have the uh, legitimacy anymore because she got caught in a big honking, stinking lie. Yeah, and I mean these. So it's just like dismissed, you know, because <laughs> whether or not she was the Babushka lady, and whether or not she saw, oh my God, who was it? Lee Oswald, David Ferry, Clay Shaw, Dean Andrews, Lyndon Johnson, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, uh, <laughs> Governor Connolly. <laughs> Frank Sinatra and Ruth Buzzy all in the in in the club doesn't matter. In Ruth, the end. Ruth Buzzy. I'll get I'll get that confirmation from a more credible source. But you know you know yeah, do I mean, thing. Well, look, so our feelings. You yeah, know? It's it's one thing you know, I mean, there's two giant claims when it comes to her. It's one thing to say, okay, I'm the Bobushka lady. I was the lady standing here who was taking a film that had it taken from me. You know, that's a, that's a huge claim. You know, that's an eyewitness. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But then to be that woman and also a woman who just happened to work next door at the Carousel Club, who just happened to meet Lee Oswald two weeks before the assassination in the company of Jack, Jack Ruby, you know, and to say that you've seen Dean Andrews, Guy Bannister, David Ferry, Emilio Santana, Jack Lawrence, all in the Carousel Club, yet nobody else and I mean nobody else ever nobody saw else. any of these guys, including Oswald. People thought they saw Oswald, but you know who they saw? They were seeing Larry Crayford because he looked like Oswald 
and he was employed by Jack Ruby at the Carousel Club. But that's a whole different story. Nobody met none of these people in the Carousel Club except for Beverly Oliver. And now look, yep. I, I got hit blindsided by <coughs> one researcher in particular, Bill Kelly. He writes the JFK counter coup blog online. Yeah, Maybe. yeah, that guy. Um, um, Bill Kelly is this the same one? He, yeah, the counter coup and counter coup two blog. Yes. Hey, you know. I'm, I'll tell you this, um, Bill Kelly. I, I do know who you're talking about. He, I, um, those those blogs. Um, you know, you know how focused my own personal studies are on army intelligence and the assassination. Yeah. Uh, you know this. Yeah. Um, it, it's a big part of what I think about. And uh, his two blogs, uh, it, it, a wellspring of awesome information on the 488th Reserve and the 112th uh, Army Intelligence Groups there in Texas and Louisiana. Uh, it's a value. I, I use this as a website a lot. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. You know, I... Uh, I sent him an email like the first year after you and I started, mm-hmm. uh, you know, inviting him on the show to talk about some of this army intelligence stuff. And he never responded. Oh, um, big shock. And there. then I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it was earlier this year when he announced his Kappa organization, I sent him another email inviting him to come on and talk some army intelligence and, uh, you know, pimp the Kappa thing, but I never got a response. Hmm. Um, there either, which, uh, you know, that, hey, that's cool, man. Um, there are really nice guys like, there are really, really nice guys named, uh, Brown, Sigmund, and Hancock, um, that are usually just, uh, anytime I give them a call, man, they're ready to come on and, on the Dallas Action Podcast and talk assassination with me. So that's cool, man. You know, ain't no big deal. Yeah, you know, and like you, I've been looking at this, reading his blog for for many years, and and you know, mm-hmm. I always thought it was very good work. You know, never a complaint, never, uh, you know. And I, I thought about asking him to come on the show, but I, I something in the back of my head probably told me that you know this guy is not going to do that. And you know, he's fairly recent to Facebook. You know, within the past couple of years, uh, at least being active in any JFK kind of realm. Um, but boy, he really dug into me about about this thing because apparently he's sitting on really? some, apparently he's sitting on some kind of information that really makes him believe that Beverly Oliver was the Babushka lady and that her story is legit. But yet he won't say what it is. He's apparently he's writing a book and it will be in this book. So I guess Doug will just have to wait for the book. And I asked him inter- in- interestingly enough. I asked Bill Kelly. I said. Just out of curiosity, Bill, I said, do you believe uh, Judith Baker and James Files and Chauncey Holt and all those characters, too? Oh, no, 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 no. Their stories are ridiculous. Well, how is you know, how is I, Bill I, um, any different than any of these other stories that are fantastic stories with no absolutely zero evidence whatsoever to back them up? You know, he 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 said, "Well, look who she was married to after the assassination." I was like, "Well, what does that have to do with anything about whether or not she's credible?" Married to who? Was she married to? She got married to some guy, some mobster guy who used to beat her and oh. treat her like shit. But what does that have See, to do I'm with not, anything? I'm, I'm not at all. I'm not at all down with the mafia centric um, 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 theories. You know that the mafia did it, or the mafia was involved. That and, and you know, uh, we I just brought him up a minute ago. Walt Brown, uh, and he told me one time. He said, you know, uh, think about this. He said, uh, if, let's say the mafia did do it. Um. Well, who's the second most important public official they ever killed? Can anybody name me that and got away with? You know, it, 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 it's like he says, it would be some sheriff somewhere in some podunk town that busted their pinball machines up there in the back of the laundromat. Yeah, if if, you know, if the mafia and, did it, it, they would have been subcontracted the hit by somebody like the Central Intelligence Agency. You know what I'm saying? Here's what, it, well, with, with the mafia, I, I, I've always thought this about that. And that is that if anybody that knows anything about the mafia... 
knows that the first and foremost rule is um, don't do anything that's going to bring up the heat, right? Right? Yeah, I mean, they didn't enjoy yeah. getting, getting hauled into Congress by don't Robert really Kennedy. Can you imagine if something goes wrong and they don't kill him, how much heat that would have brought? Well, yeah. You know? Because <clears throat> they, I, I, you know, I just don't buy it. I, I, I never have. You know, I never, I never have. And there was a book that was written about um, the mafia. Was it Ultimate Sacrifice? Is that the name of the book? Yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, it was kind of uh, this. Um, I didn't get very far into that book, man. I'll tell you that was that was a few years ago, but it was. Um, oh boy. Yeah, well, there's not, been a, not, there's been a few one, books over the years. Recommend. Not one to recommend. And of course, you know that's who the HSCA wanted to pin it on, or, or Robert Blakey wanted to pin it on, I should say. But you know, once again, we need proof. I mean, you can blame it on whoever you want all day long, but you need some kind of evidence, some kind of real proof, and an alleged Carlos Marcelo jailhouse confession to another inmate. There again, alleged, uh, you know. There again. Hey, Rob, I found uh, I found this. Look here, I found on, uh, for the listeners, uh, I, what I've done here is I've gone into my CD-ROM, my Dr. Walt Brown's 36,000-page, 64-volume um, analytical chronology of the assassination, and I'm on page 1,248 of the index. Oliver Beverly. Well, let's see what Dr. Walt says about her here. 1946, since 1970, she has made the claim that she was the woman in Dealey Plaza wearing the babushka to conceal her identity. She co-published this story in 1994 with Coke Buchanan. I supported her statement at the time of publication, but since that time, she has quote-unquote recognized far far too many people as having been in Ruby's care circle. <laughs> so that's what Dr. Walt Brown uh, has to say about that. So he's um, a rational thinker, you know. But like I said, you know, a, a lot of these people fool people when they first come out and claim to have been there, claim to have known this person, claim to have seen this, claim to wow. this, claim to that. You know, they come out and they fool a lot of people who want to believe them. But then when you start to take a closer look at them, you know, it just starts to fall apart. You know, that was um, kind of the theme in a way, you know, what you want to believe or, or, or trying to figure out what to believe in uh, this past episode of the Dallas action. Uh, <clears throat> part 95, uh, the strange tale of Robert Croft and, and other Dealey Plaza stories. And, it, you know, the point was we went through a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff that uh, lesser known sort of eyewitness accounts and, uh, you know, figuring out what to believe and what not to believe, what sits well with your good individually and what doesn't. It's not an easy task. That That's the hard part, figuring out what's, you know, well, again, I'm going to reference Walt Brown again. You know, he's, uh, he told me one time, you got to you got to know, you got to read the wingnut stuff to know the good stuff from the wingnut stuff. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's a good analogy, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what I did. I, it was listed here, it said page 897 of book one. So I loaded book one up here, and I went to the Beverly June Oliver message Entry. You want to you want to see what it says here, Rob? Yeah. Um, said um, Beverly Oliver's. Here's a note about his. By a lot of biographical info, says Beverly Oliver's credibility has weakened in the dozen plus years since the co-authorship with Coke Buchanan of Nightmare in Dallas. Many many questions have been put to her about whether or not individuals were known to Jack Ruby or to the soft underbelly of Dallas in general, and too many times. She has suddenly recalled that so and so. Oh yeah, he used to be in Jack's Club all the time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like you were saying, uh, 
uh, too many people showing up there. Um, you know, who, another guy that's got, I, I know too many folks in Dealey Plaza Syndrome is James Files. That is, that orders on a Monty Python routine that is so ridiculous. Well, yeah. That, was... I, that interview he, he gives out on YouTube, is, is, you know, the jailhouse interview, and the guy's going, who else did you see? And he, you can, you can watch the guy's little, little beady eyeballs shift back and forth while he's thinking and just snatching names out of the air, you know. David Atley Phillips, Orlando Bosch, you know, Jack Ruby. Saw Curtis LeMay there. I saw, yeah, I saw General LeMay. I was, I was only 19 and I was a carjacker from Alabama who lived in Chicago, but yeah, I knew Curtis LeMay by sight. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> well, you know what else I got lambasted for is, is, God forbid I was bad mouthing, you know, the quote, great first generation researcher Gary Shaw. And now he's the guy who allegedly met Beverly Oliver in 1970 when he happened yeah. to be looking for her and she happened to be wanting to tell her story. Now, the odds of that happening of a researcher looking for the Babushka lady and actually meeting her in a church and by accident, pure accident and finding her, I would say those are lottery esque type of odds, like one in a million, probably greater than that. Yeah, that's you know. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of that story. Uh, uh, you know, I walked into the office and just, I walked into the post office and told this random guy, excuse me in Russian, and he spoke back in Russian. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I imagine the conversation going a little something like this. Maybe they did meet each other. Maybe. I mean, we know Beverly Oliver worked at the Colony Club next door to Carousel. That's not under under debate. I mean, it's... That, okay, I can believe that. Just like Judy worked at Riley Coffee. Okay. Um, but then from this springs a whole wellspring of other things. And now Gary Shaw, if, if, if folks remember correctly, was involved in this whole, not Ricky White, Roscoe White uh, fiasco back in the 70s when he allegedly talked to Roscoe White's uh, minister, who said, you know, that his Roscoe White gave this deathbed confession of everything he'd been took a part of, and that he had all these pictures, he had these cables, you know, where he was Mandarin and there was a saw. Yeah, I was gonna say, is this the Mandarin thing? Yes, this is the Mandarin thing. Gary Shaw was behind that yeah, too. Yeah, that's uh and what's most interesting is of a course, little more bad into that code name there, pal. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, maybe, Beverly Oliver. Maybe they, thought, maybe they, Kate, maybe they were writing the the, the diary in in at the Chinese buffet or something. You know, <laughs> what are we going to call him? Well, you know, apparently his notebooks were stolen by the FBI and never given back. And this, oh yes, sir, other. yes, sir, yeah. And guess who you know Beverly what, man? Oliver saw on the grassy knoll as she crossed the street that dresses of a bush girl. She sees Roscoe White on the grassy knoll. Now, isn't that just a coincidence? You know what, that's, uh, <laughs> you mentioned something there, man, disappearing evidence. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I, I, it's, it's like the whole, uh, hey, Richard Case Nagel, you know, um, for all of the promise and tantalizing detail that was, that, that was in that book, it, 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 it just, uh, Richard Richard K. Snagel never produced a thing. And uh, these tapes and these uh, records that he supposedly had stored away that, uh, you know, were going to be so revelatory in the end, they, they we never saw them. No. We and, never saw them. And, uh, yeah, I did a show with Carmine about that a couple weeks ago. And just to follow up a little bit on that, I had asked folks about the ID that was allegedly... Uh, found in in Nigel's trunk, it was a it was a photocopy of an Oswald Selective Service card with his picture on it, but with it wasn't Lee Oswald's signature. And I said, right. no, okay, well, if he has a picture of an Oswald identification in his trunk before hey, the assassination, hey, let, me, let me interrupt you. Let yeah. me interrupt you real quick. You don't yeah. have to remind me of. Uh, of, of long term than podcast shows, pal. I listen <laughs> religiously. I know you do. Religiously. 
As a matter of fact, when I got into the podcast game with you, yours was, in fact, the very first podcast I ever officially followed <laughs> my boy, Rob Clark. Well, but I'm anyway, recapping for the listeners, you know what I'm saying? There's, some people might not have heard that show. But Well, well yeah, that's exactly right. You got to do that kind of thing. Absolutely. But I, 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 I digress. Pray tell, continue. Well, you know, I was asking if anybody knew anything about this identification, you know, that was supposedly found in the trunk. Because if Nigel had this identification in his trunk when he was arrested at the bank before the assassination, then that's something. That's a big something. Um, right, right. And the best I could tell, nobody seems to know where this thing came from. Apparently, Dick Russell said that it was returned to Nigel when he got out of prison. And it was among his belongings that was given back to him. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. I, 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 now I'm, I'm, you're, you're triggering something. Um, and I'm thinking, wasn't it found in somebody's archive? Bud Finsterwald's archive. Bud Finsterwald. That's exactly right. Like in the late seventies or, 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 or early eighties. Yep. I don't know when, but yeah, I remember. I, I think I remember. You're exactly right. It was found, somebody found it. Now, who found it in Fensterwald's? Uh, well, Dick Russell. Guy? Dick Russell found it there, but nobody mm-hmm. seems to know where Bud Fensterwald got it from, unless he got it directly from Nagel. But there is, and it, it was just filed. It was just filed away in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, archives there. Yeah, what he said was there was the the, the the list of items returned to Nagel upon his release from prison was incomplete. It didn't include everything that was given back to him. That was the official explanation. So once again, another mystery. But in the end, it leads us nowhere because we can't prove for a fact that that this photocopy was in Nagel's possession. You know, before the assassination, it's clear yeah. that it's some kind of a fake. But you know, just don't know what the, where the hell but, it came but from. But the who, what, with the who, what, when, where behind the fake is, is nobody. Nobody seems to be able to. Uh, so that, in other words, at 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 Bud Finster Wall's archives, the trail kind of goes completely cold right there. Right, and mm-hmm. you know, like like you know, like it's so out of the ordinary or so out of the realm of possibility. Let me put it like this, okay? Because we see it happening now with the, the Oswald Innocence Campaign and all these guys that are trying to make a name for themselves, become you know notorious and famous for trying to for finally solving the case and putting Oswald out on front front steps in the doorway. In the auctions, because it was this, it was that, it was a skin mask over this, and this guy was obscured, and they moved this guy over here, and you know, just just stop, because it's not only wrong possibility for researchers not to be a totally one hundred percent honest when it be, when it comes to, hey, I have an idea, Beverly, you know, you were yeah. there, okay, I'm looking for this woman, she hasn't come by. If you pretend to be this woman. You know, we can get a book deal. We could get a movie deal. You know, we could this, we could that. Hey, man, you know, uh, it, it, it happens. Right, it you happens. You know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, I, now I'm not saying it happened in Beverly, Beverly Oliver's case, because again, as I've previously stated, uh, parenthetically, to anyone who might want to get caught up in any haughty, righteous indignation over <laughs> something I might say about Beverly Oliver, close parentheses, that it happens. I firmly believe that James Files is a guy who was given a shit ton of, oh, excuse my language, am I allowed to cuss on the Lung Dumb Podcast? You most certainly are. Okay, because I'm not allowed actually. to do mine. <laughs> oh, okay, because I'm not allowed to do mine. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, you know, uh, 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 he was given a lot of study material, and he studied well, and uh, he was encouraged to do what he's done. Um, again, but now whether or not Beverly Oliver was in fact the babushka lady, I do not know because quite frankly, uh, I've never studied it that hard. And the reason I've never studied it that hard is because whether or not she was standing there, Absent the film. Now, if she could produce the real film, there's no telling what that film shows. Oh, my God. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, talk about a, a potential smoking gun. It would be different. But as it stands now, whether or not she was standing there, whether or not she saw Oswald in Ruby's Club is really, quite frankly, 
as it as it relates to my personal studies, completely inconsequential because whether or not she was standing there is not going to get me any closer to figuring out who had the who had the the rifles in their hands and who put the rifles in their hands. Right. It doesn't make any bit of of of, of difference whether or not. Uh, she is or she's not. So if she is, God bless her. If she's not, that's okay too. It's not going to piss me off because I really, it's not something I think about. Yeah. I just don't like being lambasted for suggesting that, you know, that there is a possibility that this whole thing could be a hoax perpetrated by a so-called respected researcher. It's not out of, out of the well, realm of possibility. And if he's asking me to believe her at face value with zero proof, and he's the one that produced her and let, unleashed her onto the research community, you know, then it's my right to question him. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. But I think, uh, I don't know, man, when you start, uh, when you start questioning people with, uh, you know, alleged witnesses with book deals and folks that, <laughs> um, you know, folks that will, will go to bat for him in a, in a passionate way. You know, I'm trying to avoid using the word followers, but you know what I'm well, I know trying what you to mean. say. And, and you're, you're, when you're, when you start, <clears throat> it, it's one thing to speculate on the events of the assassination. It's another thing to doubt folks who have a vested interest in what I call the conspiracy industrial complex. And believe me, folks, that's a real thing. You're damn right. That, that thing is alive and well. The conspiracy industrial complex, uh, and it's a money making machine for some. Yes. And when you start questioning, um, you know, certain load bearing walls of, of of that structure, well, then yeah, you're going to get land based and called out. Absolutely. Yeah, and conference rats and mainstays, and here we are. 22 well, years later like, you know, after her book comes out and she's still going, she's at every, every year she's at these conferences and talking and giving interviews. You know, she was a, a consultant on the Oliver Stone film. She was interviewed by the HSCA for Christ's sakes. I mean, you know what, man? And, and I, my <laughs> attitude is God bless her. You know, um, if she was really the Bushka ladies and, uh, Girl, you do your thing, and if not, you know what? Continue to do your thing because, um, you know, I'm studying primary resource documents and um, thinking about other things that, in my view, are much more important, consequential, and, and, and will bear more on what we need to try to figure out, I guess, is yeah. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. So enough, and enough. Kind of yeah, I mean enough. All right, enough about Beverly Oliver. Enough about this so-called Babushka lady. Because if 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 you're in the camp where you want to believe her, and you want to parrot her, and you want to put her on a pedestal, you go right ahead. But before you do, I would encourage you to do a little research and a little objective uh, consideration. Um, yes, and if you happen to be. In one of the, and this is uh, to the listeners, if you happen to be uh, messing around in, in, in certain Facebook forums and um, you see that person that claims that the Babushka lady was Dorothy Hunt, wife of E. Howard, just block that person. Please, it'll save you so much trouble. <laughs> <in your life. laughs> yes. Yes. Now, yes. Now, of course, last week, you know, people don't like it when I have alone nutters on the show. But you yeah. know what? I mean, th- th- look. There's some out there that you can talk to, and there's some out there that you can't talk to. And there's that short, the ones you can talk to, there's a very short list that I will even bother with. Because nine times out of ten, they're nasty, they're dismissive, and yeah. they, they produce zero anything except bugliosis quotes. Can, I can and, one guy. <laughs> One one individual on on that side of the fence that I have, you know, over the old interwebs, had um, numerous pleasant exchanges with, and that's um, a guy named Steve Rowe. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes, he's been on the show. Uh, he's uh, 
Oh, has twice. He? That must have been a while ago, though. Yeah, twice. Um, how long? How long has it been now? It's probably been a year or so. Yeah, see, man, I get that thing where people go, "Hey, you remember in Park Fifty Seven when you?" I no, I do not. Uh, uh-uh. no, sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I had him back on a while back to talk about the mysterious package. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, he's a he's a very pleasant guy, and he uh, does research. Um, he does actual research. Well, we, you know, when I first when we first got into this thing, man, and and it was only a few months before we started doing the podcast thing that I that I dipped my toes in the uh, waters that are the JFK quote unquote research community on social media, and um, yeah, man, it's it's almost immediately a, a nasty exchange with these people, just just immediately. You know, and it's yeah. Like, ah. yeah, and, it, you know, talking to these guys like, like Steve, who was a conspiracy guy, and Fred, who was a conspiracy guy as well, I think some of the, I think the turn comes from frustration. Frustration from being able to figure out what the hell really happened. And nothing seems to make sense except for, you know what, you know what makes sense? If Oswald did it, that's what makes sense. And then everything gets shifted in their mind to okay, now this is what they're going to believe. Now they're looking at everything through the lens of, well, if Oswald did it, you know, this, that, and the other. I have a hard time understanding that paradigm shift in an individual's thinking from conspiracy to Oswald did it to the Warren Commission was right. I mean, and essentially that's what, that's what they're saying. And, um, I, I can understand the paradigm shift in the other direction, you know, like, well, I always thought Oswald did it. And then you, you know, somebody on our side of the fence presents some evidence and go, oh, wow. And change that way. But I don't understand. I have a hard time comprehending that. <laughs> yeah. Cause of all the things on the conspiracy side of things that you can question or put into some kind of a, a doubt, I mean, for somebody to just. Because for me, it takes one thing, man. It takes one doubt, one thing to call into question, one thing to, to contradict something else. One thing could make this whole thing a conspiracy. You know, one one little small little piece of the puzzle, and that's it. It changes it. It changes everything else. You know, and and calls into question everything else. So, I, and they no, just I dismiss listen, it all um, out of hand. I listen to your um to your show last week um, with your guest and um, I listened to the uh, the arguments for the single bullet theory and I, I don't I don't understand how that makes sense to people right and and you're I not alone you're not alone uh, look I got a lot of flack for, for letting him even talk about 399 because we can't uh-huh. prove the provenance of it. It, you know, it came off this stretcher, and you know, here we go. It's a, it's a magic. Oh, can't bullet. prove. Oh, I can prove. <laughs> Would you like me to prove? Please do. The floor is yours. Here's what people, uh, people that that, that will uh, that will promote that are proponents of the single bullet theory. It's not that they forget this. It's that it's that they don't. They simply don't know. Um, they, <laughs> they just don't know. <laughs> um, and a lot of people on our side of the fence are not aware of this either. <clears throat> and if we could just get people to read it, it, it would, it would be like, uh, oh, okay, well that's BS. I we won't think about that anymore. Because what we've got in, 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 in 77 or 78, um, during the House Select Committee on Assassinations hearings, testimony. The FBI sent a special agent of the FBI, a ballistics expert by the name of Yates, up to Capitol Hill to testify to the House Select Committee on Assassination on the ballistics investigation, as you know, aspect of the investigation as it pertained to the to the rifle and to the bullets. All right. I want everybody to know that this is, in black and white, 
sworn hand on a Bible sworn testimony of the FBI's ballistics experts that they sent to Capitol Hill. In his testimony, this guy makes two two statements that to me are absolutely blockbuster that just simply nobody knows about. Rob knows what I'm talking about. He makes two statements. One statement he makes, one phrase he uses, they ask him about the ballistics tests that he ran on 399, CE-399, the magic bullet. He also re-examined the test bullets from 2766, the Manlicker Carcano rifle, that the FBI fired, the test bullets, in 1964. And they themselves, he himself, fired some test bullets from it in 77. So he's testifying under oath to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and they ask him about that, and he makes this statement. There were significant differences in the lands and grooves on CE 399 and the two sets of FBI test bullets. Okay. Rob, let's break this down. Okay, Break it down. significant, significant. Guys, we're going to go back to third grade grammar. <laughs> the phrase significant differences, that means they were significantly different. As in not the same. Not the same. And here's, see, here's the thing. Do you remember as a youth, Rob, watching the television children's, uh, educational television children's show Sesame Street? Loved it. Loved it. Do you know that Sesame Street taught every one of us at a very young age the basics of ballistics comparison? And it goes like this. One of these things is not like the other thing. (laughs) One of these things just doesn't belong. (laughs) And in that little refrain, you have ballistics 101. There are significant differences between that bullet and these two test bullets. Now, that was phrase number one that he used, phrase number two that he used under oath. He admitted to the House Select Committee on Assassinations that he was unable to tie CE 399 to 2766 conclusively to the exclusion of all other rifle barrels. And I don't care what kind of acrobatics do you think that bullet was capable of once it left that rifle barrel? Because the FBI told me under oath that they can't prove that that bullet had ever been in that barrel to begin with beyond a reasonable doubt. And ladies and gentlemen, at that point, that ballistics comparison, if we Oswald wins to go to trial, becomes a defense exhibit. Yep. And it's as simple as that. So you can use trajectory. Uh, 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 you can use trajectory, path, geometry, trigonometry, zoology, numerology, cryptozoology. Whatever kind of ology you want, you want to use, it doesn't matter because the FBI says, I can't prove that that bullet conclusively was fired through that barrel and only that barrel. So you're, 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 you know, Kevin Costner with his wood pointer thingy argument, even on the conspiracy side, is a moot argument, in, in, in my opinion. To even argue that the bullet could not do what Arlen Specter said it could do is a waste of your breath because of what this Yates guy said under oath. That's the only argument you need. Significant differences. Yeah, and, and post, could not... Post- could not to the exclusion of all other rifle barrels. That is a defense attorney's wet dream, baby. Yeah, and and posting that uh, little bit from the HSCA report got me kicked out of a a JFK Facebook group ran by Lone Nutters. As soon as I posted that, I was out. Well, no wonder. 
No damn wonder. And I want to I want to shout it on high myself, ladies and gentlemen, that the man that pointed this testimony out to me and um, was Rob Clark. And and I used this about the exact same argument on my show two or three times and on Black Op Radio a couple of years ago. But um, but yeah, and, and I got it from Rob. Rob found it. Um, but it, it's like, of course, because now they know, well, <laughs> here's the evidence, the FBI guy saying, don't ask me to tell you that that, that, that bullet traveled down that barrel. Uh-uh, not me, I'm under oath. I'm not going to do it. You're not going to get that from me, is basically what he did in his testimony. Because uh, he knew they didn't want to hear that either. Yeah, well, you I know? Think- didn't uh, I think Trish Fleming has pointed out the HSCA when they when they got a hold of the gun it was barely capable of even firing a bullet because of, of how rusty. Right, it was, was it him or the Warren Commission that had to shim up the scope to get it to to, well, to, to, to the, align it with the shims. The Warren Commission, yeah, but also the barrel was rusty yeah. as hell. Well, well, oh yeah, yeah. But here's the thing about the and here's another thing about the rifle that. Um, it's another common sense thing, though, Rob. It's pure common sense. Right? You know, you, how, how familiar are you with firearms? Pretty familiar. Pretty familiar, okay. Up here on my wall, you can't see it. Here, I'll hold the phone up. Look. <laughs> it's, uh, there's a, Weather, a Weatherby 300 Magnum up there. And um, it's, it's a hunting rifle. It's a very powerful hunting rifle. And it's a very expensive hunting rifle. Um, four figures. Right now, right. Oswald's was two figures, <laughs> two and a half, two and a half figures, not even that. And, and 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 what they tell us is he went up there with this with this rifle that had a left hand mounted scope. I could use it. I'm left handed. Oswald was not. Um, and but he, but but he assembled it in seconds with a dime. Stuck it out the window and pulled off an Olympic shooting feat. Well, if I take this magnum off the wall and I take it apart, this Weatherby, and then slap it back together, guess what I have to do next? I have to go sight it in. Because all the little screws, all the little tolerances are not lining up exactly to the millimeter the same as it did before when it was sighted in. Therefore, it is not in alignment. You got to go outside, you got to go down range, you got to fire. It hit three inches to the left, two down. Adjust, adjust, adjust. You got to fire again. All right, now two inches to the left, a little bit up. Adjust, adjust. That's called sighting a rifle in. If you slap that thing together, there's no telling where in the hell those bullets are going to go. And and I'm talking about a you know, fourteen hundred dollar rifle nowadays. But he did it. No, no, you have to sight a rifle in. That's just common sense. Pure common sense. So there, I took your rifle away to Lone well, Nutters. <laughs> I know. I get because I, <clears throat> I got, I got. Uh, well, somebody's saying something about uh, what about the Mauser? Well, I said, look, the problem is we don't have a Mauser in evidence. We don't have Mauser ammunition in evidence. We have a Carcano. We have an alleged Carcano bullet and bullet fragments. That's all we got to work with in the evidentiary record. I, you know, I don't think that Mauser's a, a heck of a thing. I want to believe, I, I want to believe that it was there. I, I'm kind of in the camp that, yeah, that's probably what they found. And it's only because of the Boone and Weitzman affidavits. And, you know, but, and it's like um, another, another, I was having a conversation with a guy he said, come on, man, the guy the guy had a sporting goods store, you know? He was a native Texan. That guy knew guns. You know, and if, if Boone, Boone and White, which one, which one of them was it that had the sporting goods store? Was it Weitzman or Boone, do you know? I think it was Weitzman. Okay, yeah. Um, and the point they were making, which I agree with, is the guy knew what he saw. You know, he knew what he saw. You know, I, I, I would think that in that, in that position, if you're in that position at that time and you find a rifle, that's one of the first things you're going to do. You're going to look and see what's stamped on that thing. What the hell kind of rifle is this? You know, just kind of instinctually look. 
But you know, that's just me. I'm just I'm just throwing stuff up against the wall, you know. Oh yeah. I mean, take take Roger Craig, what he said out of it. I mean, because this is years years and years later. If he would have said it off the bat, you know, like Seymour and Weissman in their affidavits, then okay. Yeah, yeah. But this is years later when Mark Lane's interviewing him for some kind of a documentary, and it's it's now it's we need something we need something uh, magnificent and spectacular to say, you know, because God forbid I trash another first generation brilliant researcher. Um. I, who was opportunistic in every way. Um, Bob, I can't take you anywhere. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I got, can't take this guy anywhere. I'm trashing Gary Shaw, Mark Lane. I mean. Man, man. But, you know, I, I noticed in a thread the other day, someone, uh, I think it might have even been our friend Will Hart over at JFK Primary Sources, posted in a thread. He had been listening to some old May Brussels archives. May mm-hmm. Brussels archives and and she was, uh, she didn't trust somebody and was really running them down. I can't remember if it was, uh, it was Penn Jones, I think. She was really running down Penn Jones on one of her episodes. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me then, well, if you, if you, if you've ever listened to her, 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 her archive over the years, she didn't like anybody. No, she didn't, she didn't like, she didn't like Mark Lane either. Uh, you, you know, well, yeah, well, I was just thinking off the top of my head, okay, well, if she had a problem with um, Jones, well, just off the top of my head, I remember her her, her going after Weisberg, Mark Lane, a lot. Um, uh, Fensterwald, she didn't trust both Fensterwald. Um, yeah, you, you get the feeling she trusted very few people, you know. Um, but she trusted John Judge, you know. Yeah. Um. You know who loved but, yeah, you know Rob, who loved them, Rob, Mark Lane. Yeah, you know that that stuff, man. I tell you, when you start <laughs> talking about that stuff, you know the Mark Lane and the fishiness of, of of Jamestown, man. I tell you, people come out of the woodwork on you, boy. You, you, oh no, we do not speak of this. No, I know, I know. And then they come at uh, you with pitchforks and torches, man. Woo. But I'm not the first one to bring it up that you know. He could have possibly been a CIA lawyer from the get-go. And you know what I'm saying? Who better to lead the opposition when they felt that there was going to be a problem when it comes to, you know, there being a conspiracy? That's just my Well, opinion. you know, the whole, uh, the whole thing, um, I think I heard Meg Russell say one time, you know, the funny thing about Jamestown, you know, uh, Mark Lane got out with the money. You know, and uh, <laughs> uh, that is a strange and terrible saga, with the, whatever the hell went down, you know, down there. Uh, and Mark Lane was, for better or for ill, um, a part of it in whatever way he was a part of it. Now, I'm not I'm not discounting, oh, here we go, now they're going to get out of your attack of Mark Lane. No, I'm not. I'm not. I, as a matter of fact, uh, I read... Best evidence when I was 11 and um, I think the very next year, a um, little video store. Remember VHS video stores, Rob? They had uh, I do. the black and white book, the judgment film, and I rented that. So it was really kind of like my second, uh, you know, uh, 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 the second object of reference, you know, that, that, that I ingested. Um and digested for that matter, uh, was rushed to, uh, rushed to judgment. So yeah, I mean, the guy was, uh, was definitely vocal, but you know, I, I hear what you're saying. You know, uh, you think about the word gatekeeper and you think, man, there's a little bit there that points to that slight possibility, you know, and, uh, if people think that's unfair of me to say that, that I'm attacking Mark Lane, I'm not, but the possibility remains and the ev- evidence is, uh, a little tantalizing, and uh, if that offends your sensibilities and your sense of respect for our elders, then it's my opinion. Hashtag GFY. That's all I'm telling you. Yeah, I mean, and like I said, we're not the first people to think this. You know, right? There was many people. We're calling... certainly not the first to talk about it. No. Yeah, many people calling into question this stuff as it was happening back in the day. Um, yeah, I, I must admit, though, I'm not very very well versed on a lot of those details. I haven't done that studying and that digging. Um, but you know, other than, uh, you know, listening to May Russell when it happened, 
you know, right. Uh, right. or as it happened, rather, um, you know, in her archives. But other than that, yeah, I don't know a whole lot about it other than that it is indeed fishy, sir, fishy. Well, so, something else I wanted to talk on or touch on here, I mean, since we're talking about irresponsible and researchers, is is the Mac Wallace fingerprint. Um, hey, can I, can I, can I run a caveat here? <laughs> yeah. Can I run a caveat here? Yeah, okay. please I, do. Can I run a disclaimer? Okay, this is a disclaimer from the Dallas Action. <laughs> I do such a fantastic job on my podcast of, like, not talking about people. But damn it, every time Rob Clark gets me on his show... <laughs> <laughs> this I'm is an sorry, open. This is an open forum. I want you to feel like we're at home and you're in a comfortable place, and you know, sit back in the leather chair and relax, and and let's get it in. I mean, we. I'm down, man. I'm look, down. And, you know, it is. It is a lot more like that because my my stuff is uh about three quarters scripted. You know, I, I I take pretty copious notes and outline an episode, but not 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 here, no, no sir. I don't script anything, so. You've had Joe Mellon on your show. She's been on. Uh, I have. She's been on Chuck O'Chelly's show. She's been on Black Op Radio. Uh, she's been on a couple other shows. By Wilson's show. Um, very prominent author. Does a lot of research. Wrote, I think the the books on Garrison. Um, just has oh. a new book out called Fa- Faustian Bargains, in which she which she reexamined the evidence of the Mac Wallace fingerprint. And she actually hired another fingerprint expert to take another look at the fingerprint evidence and the unidentified print found in the sixth floor of the depository. And she actually also had Mac Wallace's. They found a print. They found a print in the suppository. <laughs> yeah, one unidentified print. Um, <laughs> in the depository, not the suppository. <laughs> It's working, damn it. Um, oh, I, I just had a horrible thought. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. I'm here uh, for you, brother. I'm here for you. You're lucky we're recording right now, or else I'd say something to make you laugh. Um, <laughs> we got all day. All right. Where, where are we here? Okay. Uh, I done lost Mac my train of, Okay. Mac Wallace. One, un- one unidentified print. Well, Mm-hmm. Okay, as everybody knows, you know, there was work done by Jay Harrison and, and Richard Bartholomew and and uh, all these guys back then when they got Nathan Darby to do this fingerprint uh, examination. But they did not have Mac Wallace's military Navy fingerprints. And they were working from photocopies of his arrest records and the fingerprint. Well, Joan Mellon got a crystal clear photograph of the fingerprint from the archives, and she got Mac Wallace's naval fingerprint records, and she got his arrest records, the original card. And she hired another independent fingerprint analysis of this unidentified print. And when she was writing her book, she wanted to write this book on Mac Wallace. She wanted to pin this stuff on him. But... She thought it best to take everything and reanalyze it because Mac Wallace does have a uh, interesting history. Um, you know, he was a murderer. You know, we can prove that he killed one person. Um, you know, who was banging his wife? Yeah, the partial guy, the old, uh, the old guy, the, the inspector, or whatever. You no, know, this the... was uh, this was Kinsey, or uh, oh, the golf pro. Yeah, the golf pro. He was banging his wife. Yeah. That's understandable. Okay, you're going to want to kill somebody who's banging your wife. You know, okay, Mac Wallace had the balls to actually do it. Okay, and there was a law back in the day on the books, you know, in in Texas that you could you could do this, you know, and and technically get away with it. Um, but I digress. Now I've seen some scuttlebutt. Oh, but that's called the he needed killing, Your Honor, law. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why'd you kill it? Well, he needed killing, Your Honor. Dismissed. Yep, he was banging my wife, sir. Okay, um, you know that's the only provable homicide we can prove that Mac Wallace did. Now, there's no proof at all he was LBJ's henchman or that he killed all these other people, including LBJ's sister, and on and on and on and on and on. Now, the right. one thing that all these LBJ did, did guys rely on is this fingerprint analysis. And when we were at the conference, Doug, we heard actually Richard Bartholomew present this his little presentation about the Mac Wallace fingerprint. 
Um, right. Was not convinced then, still not convinced now. But, no. you know, thankfully, Joan Mellon redid this. And in the back of her book, you know, she, she has the entire technical analysis, you know, it's one thing to say it, but it's nothing to prove it. So then you got to prove it. You got to have pictures. You got to, you know, all that stuff, which she has in her book. And I've seen a lot of scuttlebutt online about, you know, there's a lot of researchers kind of at odds because of, you know, certain people sitting on certain amounts of work, uh, allegations of, of people being dishonest and uh, not letting go of some files that people need and this, that, and the other. And a lot of people being butthurt about personal things that really have no bearing whatsoever when it comes to the, actually, okay, let's get this thing right once and for all. Is it Mac Wallace's fingerprint or not? That's the only thing that matters. Because if it's not Mac Wallace's fingerprint, then all these LBJ guys can go jump off a cliff and sayonara, see you later. Because that's it, well, John. That, that, that's not going to... I mean, you know, people people are so vested in the theory that they have staked out. I mean, um, this is what we do. You know, this is what we do. We, 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 okay, I think this happened, and then you get your sword and your shield, and you get in your ready stance, and you go, okay, now, for the rest of my life, I'm going to defend it. And that does not leave you any room to grow. That does not leave you any room to learn. You know, I do not believe that Mac Wallace had anything to do with the Kennedy assassination based on what I've learned so far. And by extension, I do not believe that Lyndon Johnson had anything to do with the murder plot based on what I've learned so far. It's like you said a few minutes ago, unconvinced, not I'll never believe it happened. Unconvinced. Right. There's a substantial difference in, in the two. Um, I am not convinced be, uh, uh, to any measure that Johnson was, was, was involved in Kennedy's assassination, but if that proverbial smoking gun shows up tomorrow that is unequivocal, unassailable, beyond a shadow of a doubt, proof. Why well, put myself publicly in a position to be forced to deny it based on past stubborn thinking? Well, that's, that's the whole reasoning of the thing. These guys have been convinced of this for 20 years because of this Mac Wallace fingerprint identification. Yeah. And it's been written in stone for them for 20 years. And they've been right. You know how many books contain the name Mac Wallace and, and finger LBJ as a mastermind, at least five or six in the past 15 years using this Mac Wallace print identification. And it's, it's, you know, if, if it is Mac Wallace's fingerprint, then, okay, we've got a big problem. And that's what they yeah. think. You know, they, yeah. they were convinced that this is Mac Wallace's fingerprint, then God damn it. Well, he, he's only tied to one person, and that's LBJ. So there you go. You know, exactly. And, and, and if that were to happen, you know, and I've done a lot of naysaying about the Mac Wallace theory, about the LBJ theory. But, but again, it's not that my position isn't, oh, that didn't happen. That would have never happened. It's not that. Is it based on the evidence that has been presented? The, the evidence that has been presented to me in favor of that viewpoint, and that scenario is simply not convincing. But the difference is being willing to be convinced, which I am. I'm sure you know because I tell you, I'm not like anti. It's not. It's not a. I think it could be anti-mafia did it or the anti-this theory or anti-this theory. I'm pro whatever in the hell the truth turns out to be. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's yeah. the long and the short of it. You know, um, all, all of these folks that, you know, will, will, will get nasty uh, about whatever theory that they, that they are proponents of, um, you know, I'm, 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 
don't be, convince me, because if LBJ is, in fact, the mastermind, I damn well want to know. And I want it known, if that's the truth. Right. But so far, the arguments for that are not convincing to me. And it's just that simple. Yeah. Right. If it can be proven without a shadow of a doubt that that's Mac Wallace's fingerprint, then we got a problem. Okay. But yeah. ever since it was done, it's been called into question and there's been problems with it. And it's only now, 20 years after the fact, that we have another independent analysis done on this fingerprint that says, you know what? The first person got it wrong. This is not Mac Wallace's fingerprint. We actually have good material to work with now. We actually have the latest technology to work with now because I believe back in the day, Nathan Darby was in his eighties and hadn't recertified in quite some time. Now people say, well, that's not relevant because you know, I'm a house painter. Do I need to go every two years to get my license? Do I need to learn how to paint again? I mean, it's not something you just forget how to do. The problem is when it comes to fingerprint identification, there are techniques that are developed and new technology that comes out that you need to stay on top of to properly do this stuff. And then even in the late nineties, Doug, we had computers. Okay. Not great computers, not fast computers, but we had computers. But I believe that Darby was doing this using photocopies and sitting here doing it old school, looking from, you know, putting them side by side in front of him and with a magnifying glass you know, looking at one and then looking at the other and say, okay, well, there's a match. Okay, there's a match. Uh, we have a match here. We have a match here. We have 14 matches. So, therefore, that's more than we need. That's a match. Yep. Now, this man yeah, is I, in his know. 80s with a magnifying glass looking at photocopies. Yeah, that's not optimal. No, that's not optimal. Uh, as far as uh, Miss Mellon's book, uh, Man, I, I don't. I don't know. I. I it, it seemed. Uh, was there? Have you read the book? I have not read the book. I have only heard her is, interviewed about it. Um, is there any? Is there any? Um, other than the finger, the new fingerprint analysis, is there anything new in that book? Oh yeah. Uh, I think the allegation is made that Mac Wallace wasn't even in Texas at the time. I think he was in California, yeah. at least that she alleges. And, and you know, none of that matters. None of that matters where, you know, where, if you can prove he wasn't in Dallas, then that's even a bigger bonus. But the problem is with all these guys. Yeah, that, that, would, wrote, be, that, that would be the nail in the coffin of that particular theory. You know, if you could prove he's, he, that he wasn't anywhere near Dallas, for sure. But, I mean, at the same time, um, at present, what we have are nothing but allegations. We have no proof that he was anywhere near Dallas to begin with now, you know? Yeah. Which is where I'm at with it, you know? Again, my gut tells me he wasn't involved, Mike Wallace. Um, the fingerprint analysis would seem to back that up. But, you know, if you've got uh, convincing evidence that he was, show it to me. I'm willing to be convinced. Well, apparently there's some big hot debate on the internet, you know, because the person who has the files, um, you know, is, is sitting on them. And I believe he's the only one, the only one he's given to so far is Joan Mellon. But there might be a reason for that, Doug. I think you might know what that reason you, is. You, now you're talking about the Jay Harrison files, right? That Walt uh, Brown yeah. had. Yes, sir. Well. You know what? I happen to know that we were reading from the uh, chronology a minute ago, weren't we? Yes, we were. You know, there's a part in there. If you'll give me a few minutes, I will. Uh, uh, yeah, why you, keep yeah, why you look that tail. up? I believe there's, there's uh, in, in Walt, Walt Brown's chronology, there's a big long part called Book One. Um, let me get in here. Uh, but yeah, as far as. Uh, you know, Joan, uh, Miss Mellon was nice enough to come on the Dallas action, and we talked about, um, uh, we'll talk while I look this up. We talked about um, um, the... Um, Angelo and Leopoldo and... Yeah, the, the, the uh, Bernardo de Torres and Angelo Mercado thing. Yeah. Um, and I know she's been on, um, 
she's been she's been making the rounds um, on the internet, on the podcasts, and on the uh, internet shows, you know, and on radio shows and things. And, and she's uh, speaking at Lancer this year on this very yeah. topic. And somebody, you know, somebody uh, uh, sent me a, a, a message just a couple weeks ago, a couple three weeks ago. You know, hey, uh, you know, she just did so and so show. Are you going to have her on? You know, uh, she's got the new book out, and I said. Ah. Uh, no, I have not invited her on to talk about the new book. And this person was <laughs> was a little, you know, reclaimed over it. Well, why not? She's been on this show before. Uh, why not now? And, and look, it, it's like this, Rob. Um, hey, you know, authors do that. They make the rounds. You know, when, right. when, and that's all well and good. That's awesome. I think it's I think it's fantastic to talk about the new books. But with my thing, man, it's 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 more or less. Uh, I, I invite people on when I want to talk to them about something specific, you know. Um, and that this, this was uh, late last year, and I ran across. I was I was, I was looking into uh, Bernardo de Torres and ran across an article she wrote in '94 in the Key West Citizen yeah. about Angel Obrigado, and contacted her about that. Um, right. and, and we did the episode, but you know, I, my thing is, um, why invite someone on my podcast so they can do the same spiel they did on two others last week? Right. And that's, that's the, that's a great okay. point. Cause somebody asked me, why, when are you going to have Joe Mellon on? And I told him, I why? Said, so you can, why? So you can listen to or say the very same thing that on my show or Rob show that you heard her say three days ago on somebody else's, you know, I mean, nah, that's cool. And you guys do your thing, but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I'll have the occasional author on, you know, but mm-hmm. he, it turns into a lot of them talking and me saying, yep. Yeah, mm-hmm, okay. And which is, which is that's fine, cool. which is fine. But you know, we're not me and you, what we do is not, it's not like a radio show. You know, no. I, I'd much rather talk to a researcher than an author. And that's not downing authors, but you know, authors have, you know, certain things to sell. You know, they want to sell their book. They want to tell about their book and that's yeah. what they stick to. And I'm not downing them because I've talked to authors on here before and that's, that's a fine and good. But most of the authors I talk to on this show are people that you probably aren't going to hear on black op radio. You're not going to hear on, on Chuck's show or anything like that. You know, it's, it's but these people don't have a, a big enough forum. It's, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, you know, I've had um, lots of well-known authors on mine. They were, you know, Doug Horn and, uh, oh gosh, Doug Horn, Ed Petro, Walt Brown, Larry Hancock, Bill Simpkins, Joe Mill, you know, a, a, a good, and they're all nice people to a person. Uh, John Barber, but, um, I, 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 I purposely try not to do that thing when a book comes out. It was different. Last year, when Dr. Jeffrey Caulfield's brilliant book on General Walker and the murder of President Kennedy came out, it was different. He did three shows with me um, because he got a bu- because he wasn't towing the Dulles did it line. He quite frankly got a bunch of shit from a lot of people. Yeah, and um, simply because he was presenting evidence. Linking Miltier, Joseph Miltier, and General Walker to the conspiracy to murder the president that didn't involve Alan Dulles or LBJ as the mastermind. And uh, he got treated pretty unfairly by a lot of people and didn't want to do any promotion. And I had to like get a, a guy to sort of reach out on behalf of me and, and, and let him hear a couple of past episodes of the show on General Walker that I did the first year before he would agree to come on. And it's simply because of that. Because he was presenting this credible evidence that went against what some in the community called the consensus view of CIA privacy in the case. <laughs> um, he, I, again, it's another example of somebody cutting into somebody else's conspiracy industrial complex. Right. The leading, yeah, yeah. 
the now, leading Pat- Patrice Lumumba happened, and Dag Hammarskjöld. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hey, you know <laughs> I, I I'm just I'm, I'm venting a little more, but it's the same thing. You know he didn't he didn't want to do uh, he was he was real sort of real sort of standoffish at first until he heard. Um, I, he actually listened to some of the archive and heard, oh, wow, man, this guy's all over the Walker stuff, you know, and a lot of things that I talked about in the podcast, he talked about in his book with General Walker. So once he figured that out, then I was, I was a friendly, it was different, but it's simply because, you know, of, of that thing. And, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm just saying for my own purposes, like with, like you say, we don't do radio shows. I don't, I consider the Dallas action to be an ongoing conversation. And it has the content of the show no in no way, shape, form, or fashion has ever reflected um what issues are pressing within the community or whatever. You know, what who's pissed off about what and you know, who's calling who a liar and you know, what theory is this? What's the hot theory of the day? It's never been about that. It's always been about what I happen to be studying at the time. Right. Period. And I just come on and it's kind of like, hey, guys, look what I found. This is cool. And we talk about it. And, you know, you try to tell a good story. And sometimes what I'm studying, go, and I'll go, I need to talk. I'd like to talk to you. This guy, like with uh, the, the two episodes we did this year with Larry Hancock on the Gunbook Cowboys, the Interpen Mercenaries, B. Dow, Santiago, Hargraves. Uh, that's what I happened to be studying, and I went, I went to him, you know. Um, so no, no, um, it's it, it 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 it'll never happen. Um, very, very rarely happened that you'll see, you know, an author with a current release on the Dallas action just to pimp that release. Um, I don't get paid to promote anybody's book, and uh, um, I don't get I don't get paid. Period. <laughs> but you know, I will invite them on if 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 something that that they've done in the past pertains to what I'm studying, but uh, nah, man, I'm not, I'm not on that, uh, I'm not on that publicity train. I, 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 I jumped off of that thing. No, I hear you. And I, I think people get it twisted. You know, that, that what we do is, is some kind of a public service or it's some kind of a, you know, like a, a radio show where we're, we're, you know, we're selling stuff and we got, you know, we charge for our past archives and, you know, I don't. no, no, I know we don't. But um, yeah, we don't. No, no, it's it's absolutely free, baby. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely free. Every, uh, exactly. You know, and like I said, you know, like you said, I think it's a damn shame, man, about Caulfield's book. I mean, it kind of came and went and gone. Like, but, you I know, I, I know learned believe. mine. Huh? I, there, there are some people that, that I have a lot of respect for that are, that, that did pay attention to that book. Um, uh, Garland Brown, for example. Um, well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, who liked it? it on the whole, had, had yeah, on the whole, though, it didn't get much fanfare, in, in at least from legitimate circles, and it kind of came and went. You know, I can't even believe that, you know this guy's not even speaking at what, at a conference this year or last no, year. No, he he didn't he didn't get invited last year, and that's because yeah he he he. His his theory, his theory. Um, oh well, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and say, well, I agree with what he said in his book 100. percent No, but um, there's so much good evidence and so much important information in that book for it to be lambasted just because it didn't end with the sentence. And by the way, all of the above was orchestrated by Dulles. Is uh, Kind of mind blowing, you know. It, it, it was not. It was not given the respect that it deserved. That's for damn sure. No, it wasn't, and that's that's a damn shame. Um, and of course, we know the reasons for that. We don't need to publicly state them again. <laughs> but uh, go listen to some past shows, and I'm sure you'll hear us talk about it. Um, but- oh yeah, yeah. Rob, Rob just he, he puts me <laughs> he puts me on a soapbox and pokes me with a stick every time I come on the. Awesome. I'm actually very nice on my podcast, guys, if you've never heard it before. Yeah, and I'd encourage everybody to check it out, of course, of course. Now, have you found uh, 
in the past 20 minutes. Yes, and we found I did, I did. I'm sorry. Our Uncle Walt You're talking passes. About, uh, here it is. And this is in uh, 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 the analytical chronology, uh, Walt Brown's uh, CD-ROM, the 36,000-page work on the uh, JFK assassination, which everybody needs to get. And you can contact Dr. Walt Brown at K-I-A-S dot W-S at yahoo.com, or no, K-I-A-S that, I'll, I'll look it up. I now forgot it. But anyway, let me read this part. Uh, this is from his chronology um, from uh, the preface. Much source material comes from the archive of Jay Harrison, and it speaks for itself. A good number of people who will read this, I hope, knew or met Jay at one time or another, and knew of his massive collection. There have been some ugly and personal outcries by those who insist I'm sitting on Jay's this is in bold print, four million pages. And to those who talk the talk, but don't walk the walk, I'll keep it simple. Show me yours, and I'll show you mine. For each person that has demanded Jay's materials, nobody has mailed me their research materials. And that's what he said about that in Dr. Walt Brown. Right, so how does Joan have this stuff? Well, you know what? She probably mailed her research to Walt. He probably now has the Navy fingerprints, the crystal clear photograph from the archives, and all of this fingerprint analysis. Uh, that's Walt, 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 Walt. Walt is a friend of ours. Yes. Yours and mine. Um, he's been on my show four or five times. He's a friend of ours. Walt's a good dude. Okay, and you said, you know, well, why did Joan Mellon get to see him? She must have sent him something. I don't think it was even that complicated. I think probably what happens, and some of these people that, that, are, that are bitching that, that he won't, you know, send the archives to them, Joan Mellon probably, if I had to guess, no one walked Brown as well as I do, she probably called up and asked nicely if she could come look through them. Well, yeah. That's probably yeah. that's probably all it took is to call him on the phone or send him an email and ask very nicely, "Can I come look through the archives?" And he yeah, probably say, I'm trying sure, to straighten this Mellon, thing out. Yeah, and say I'm trying to straighten this thing out once and for all. That easy. Yeah. And if whoever these people are that are that are complaining about it or giving him hell about it, if they, I, I, I would almost bet money that if they contacted him and said. Dr. Brown, can I please look through Jay Harrison's archive? Can I come up there and look, please? Thank you, sir. He probably say yes. But no, people got to raise hell and make an issue out of it on the Internet in front of God and everybody. You know? Agreed. It's ridiculous. What I'm saying is, Joan Millen probably just asked the guy nicely and politely. Well, she has That's a, probably she has, all this took. She has a body of respectable work behind her, too. You know, it's right. not like Joe Joe Schmo. You know, asking for this stuff. You know what I mean? Hey, let me tell you this, and I want and and and, and again, I want everybody to know because Walt Brown's a good dude. Don't listen to anything bad anybody says about him. Anybody, anybody, don't listen to anything bad anybody says about him. Because I mean, even me, even a schmo like me, I've got an open invite. Yeah, man. Anytime you want to come up to Jersey, spend a couple days and look through Jay's archive if you're looking for something, no problem. It's because I asked nicely. People seem to forget just that little thing. Yeah, I mean, it's that's not, an important point. They're not, they're not, they're not bitching because they, they, they don't have possible access. They're complaining because he just won't give it away. <laughs> that's the difference. You know, that's the difference. Well, come on, Doug. I mean, tell Walt to go photocopy four million pages and throw them in the mail to, to whoever wants them. Hey, you're going to have to give me a couple of weeks. <laughs> Cover it up. Cover it up. But no, I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, well, yeah, why, I mean, how, why did Joe Mellon get the look? She probably just asked. Yeah, hey, buddy, what do you think? Sure. People would be surprised uh, how far a little bit of politeness will get them now, you know? Yeah, and there's so little of that on the in the forums and online these days. But when it comes to, you know, interacting with other researchers, it's you know, it's just Ooh, ridiculous. Hey, that yeah. reminds that reminds me. Yeah, I don't like that word anymore. 
What's that? Researchers? Uh, yeah. Ooh, they'll say, don't ever call me that again. I'm a student. <laughs> Because everybody that seems to, 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 to purposely tag themselves with that title or that descriptive usually ends up being somebody that I just don't care to be associated with, it seems like. Yeah. Why well, I'm a I researcher. She... You, know, you know what? I'm not. I'm a student. I study research that was done by others before me. It's, you know, and uh, no, I am a, I'm just purely a student of the assassination, trying to figure it out. Yeah, if you're not sitting your ass in the archives for days and weeks and months on end, you're not a researcher. You're just not like like our boy Michael Best over at Glomar Disclosure. Right. If you're not, you know, digging through the files at the archives and, and you know, like like Weisberg, like uh you know, a lot of these other guys, um, I'm sorry, but I you know, when the term researcher comes to mind, that's what I think of. Somebody digging in the trenches, somebody spending hours and days and months and at the archives and precious time and resources. If you're just reading about the case and, and you know, you're doing a little online investigation, you have an interest in the case. That's all you have. You have an interest. You're not researching anything. Like Doug said, you're a student. You're learning from what other people have done before you. Yeah, well, that's, that's I was speaking for myself there. You know, well, I mean, that's you're speaking for everybody I, that's not sitting yeah, in the ass in the archives. Myself, you know, armchair analyst. You know, um, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, yeah. talking about talking about the podcast, you know, like we talked about before, man, it's uh, it, it, if people think we're doing it to make money, God, they are so off. It's not that I'm, I'm complaining because I, I don't care about that. I have a job, you know. It's fun. It's fulfilling. And um, you really do kind of uh, develop a rapport with your audience and kind of a bond with them, you know. Yeah. Because they always come back. Um, and, you know, get a few bad apples, man. But uh, overall, over overall, it's, it's, it's been a good experience for me, for sure. You know what I hope, Doug? What's that? I hope this episode sounds good. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, yeah, me too, man. Me too. I'm I'm actually outside. We're talking about the K- the Kennedy assassination, and I'm going out to my convertible to get a pack of smokes at the same time. Technology yeah, is well, amazing. I hope this doesn't amazing. sound like I'm, like I'm eating my microphone. You know, I and thank you to folks uh, like James and John who support the show. I've been able to invest in a little bit more technology here, and I'm hoping that. This show sounds a hell of a lot better, and that the problems are fixed. So it's thanks to you know these listeners that support the show that I'm able to do stuff like this, and you know try to make the show sound better. Because like I said before, this is not a radio show. This is not Black Op Radio where I'm sitting in a hundred hundred thousand uh, dollar mixing studio with all this equipment around me, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I'm just like you with a computer. That's and I don't know a lot of this technical shit. When it comes to, you know, levels and, and editing and all this other mess that I got to do, I'm doing the best I can. And I know there's issues, you know, people, you don't have to point them out to me every week. I know, and I've tried that you will not hear me vape one time on this episode because I got a microphone kill switch <laughs> on this some bitch. I don't trust, I don't trust the mute button no more because, uh, you know, in the past couple shows I've been hitting the mute button, but yet my microphone is still recording. Uh, so hopefully that won't be an issue this time. And I apologize. You for know, that. until you told me a while ago off the air, a, a while ago that that was a vape pen. I swore, yeah, I swore that was a water bong. Uh, yeah. I've gotten accused of hitting the bong, uh, <laughs> you know, all, all kinds of good stuff, but that's just because, you know, my stupid Skype recorder is recording my audio, whether I hit the mute button or not. Like if I'm talking to you and I hit the mute button, you're not going to hear me vaping. But it's still getting recorded in the final mix of things. That's what it's everybody mute, hears. It's on the other end. Yeah, it comes out on the other end. But this time, I guarantee you, you will not hear me vape one time. I have hit the kill switch every time I vaped. And uh, hopefully the audio levels are a lot better this time. At least I hope they are. They look they, they look like they are. So we'll find out. But, you know, it, you know unless... You know, like James and uh, John and, and other folks like them that have helped support the show. 
If you haven't helped support the show, then you really don't have a right to say anything about how the show sounds. Um, you know, this is, you know, in order for this show to sound great and to have awesome audio and no technical glitches, you know, that requires a lot of software that costs money and hardware that costs money that I just don't have the capacity for. Um, it's a podcast. It's not a radio show. I don't know how to make that difference much clearer. You know, I know there's podcasts out there that sound great. And you know what? You go look on Patreon and the damn shows are making $20,000 an episode. This is yeah. not, this is not that. This is not sword and scale. This is not Tannis. This is not the black tapes. This is, I wish it's it was. Not. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I wish it was, you know, cause then this would be a full-time job. You know what I'm saying? And it would sound so fucking great. You know, you, you hear me fart. And and breathe, and you would hear flies crawling on the wall. It would be so great, the audio. Um, I'd build a studio with soundproof walls and have all this great equipment. And, but you know, I like to say we'll get there, but I doubt it. Um, so it is what it is, you know, the audio is what it is, and I'm working on the issues. I know I told you last week, don't you don't have to point them out. I got yeah, it. Bob. God damn it, I got it. I meant to I'm working on to you it. about that. <laughs> Getting loud, Mario. Mario, it's kind of like, have you been having microphone problems or something like that? Yes, yes, I have. I have. I'm working well, can on you it. Can you please get that fixed? Yeah, I'm working you on it. You came in awful hot last week. That's all I'm saying. I did. I did come in pretty goddamn hot, didn't I? You did. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, that show I did with Bart Camp. I did that show. My damn three... dog, I was three counties away. Three mother effing times I recorded that show. That's almost nine hours of prayer man lunchroom encounter. And I look, I love Bart to death. Ooh. I love Bart to death. I think he's great. I think he's a great guy. He's a great researcher. Does great work. But let me tell you, we that audio was horrible the first couple times. You know, and and there's so much information with what he was saying. You know. It, we couldn't just do an hour show about it. It had to be almost three hours yeah. long. And to get, finally get it right, or not even right, just decent enough to put out there was a chore. And, you know, people don't realize this, but, you know, there, there's a lot of hard work behind what we do here. You know, sometimes, sometimes we just get on here and wing it. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, it, it's arduous, but, you know, I, tr tr I want to yeah. make the show listenable. I'm not just trying to put trash out there so everybody's like, what the hell is this guy? You know, sounds like shit. The thing about it, I, I, I think people, uh, of course, you joke about just kind of getting on the air and winging it. Um, but I don't think people realize, you know, um, I knew I knew early on, you know, in, in the podcasting thing, you know, hey, well, this is a tough crowd. If you get something wrong, they're going to let you know. And... Um, I have re-recorded episodes of my podcast. I said, um, talking about the audio incident, it was early on. It was one of the first ten I did when we started. And I repeatedly said that it happened on October 28th. The three times, for some dumbass reason. So I re-recorded the whole thing. You know. I mean, it was a great, other than that, it was a great episode. But I thought, you know, and this was early on in the process, if I upload this and say three times that the audio incident happened on October 28th of 63, I can't yeah, do that. Yeah. yeah, I can't do that. You know, what kind of schmuck am I? So here I did. I had to, have, you know, re record it. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but I think what people, there is a lot of preparation that goes into that. I mean, you, you kind of have to take notes because, uh, you know, there's so much detail and so much information and, and you know, people are, wa are listening and taking notes. I mean, literally, literally. Oh, yeah. And, and look. And check your, check in your sources as they listen to the podcast. Yeah. So, yeah, you got to do some preparation, man. You You have to sketch out a narrative just so you don't. It's not obvious that you are rambling. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, you uh, remember the greatest invention when we first started doing this podcast was a goddamn pause button. Oh, wow. Yes. Yes. I don't know how many times I would get 20 minutes into a show and just fuck it all up. 
and have to start over again. Well, you know, if you were the one, Rob Clark, I have to credit with, um, when you go to the Play Store to your apps, the Spreaker's, the Spreaker Studio app, um, which is what we use to create these podcasts, you would go over there to the reviews, and about every other day for a while, there would be, we need a pause button, damn it, this sucks, Rob Clark. Yep. <laughs> Rob is responsible for that, <laughs> and I'll never forget the first time I used it. I was actually doing a show on, uh, well, I remember it was an Edwin Walker show, and uh, uh, I, I suddenly realized that it was there. Oh, there's a pause button. So, hell, I, I, I stopped at the sentence. Hit pause, marked it, went outside, smoked a cigarette, went to the bathroom, came back in, hit on pause, carried on. It's the greatest thing ever. You're right. Yeah, or if you, or if you forgot a date or a fact or something and you, you, know, you knew it was coming, you could hit the pause button, go check it, come back, and seamlessly yeah, integrate it you're, like you're the smartest person in the world. Happy for a while. Yeah. But you know what? I can't, I can't say enough good about Spreaker.com. Um, I'll shout that to anybody on high. You talk about making... The art of creating a podcast and promoting a podcast easy for the layman. Wow. Yeah, because we were looking for some way to do this very easily when we first started. And that was basically, I got lucky and stumbled across this Spreaker deal. And yep. tried it out. I was like, okay, this is about as easy as it's going to get. Because when you start looking online, you know, you're talking about recording and this, and you have to mix it with this and insert your music this way and that way. And it it was crazy. Um, and Spreaker has come a very long way in, in, in two years, especially with your studio. And, and The just, studio app is amazing. It's, it's literally a two-track studio that, that that's in your phone. And uh, you can dump uh, tracks in and out. You can mix one hot, one low, one, you know. Um, like when yeah. I do my thing, you know, like usually on the Dallas action, a song will start. And I'll pick a section out of, uh, of the song to say, you know, whatever. Hey, how's it going? Welcome to the Dallas action. Well, that's a, the, the vocal is a separate track. Me, me greeting the audience, then the, then the music. It's like a little, like a little portable studio is what it is. You. You play the music, and then I hit that track, turn it down, you know. The greeting plays, and then the monologue and the interviews on a completely different track, and you play it whenever you want, you know. And, and really, the ease of use and with the RS feed and the way that's ex accessible to, uh, you know, networks and, and, and other places, feeds can pick your show up. Um, I, can't say, uh, I can't say enough good about uh, the, the whole experience in three years with Spreaker has been... Uh, just, just pretty carefree, really. Never, yeah. never had any problem. Yeah, and never finally, you, yeah, I was always asking them too. You know, all right, they have a share button for Facebook and and Twitter, and Google Plus, which is fine, and they work great. But I was like, you know, I want to be able to share this to YouTube too, without having to get yeah. on on a computer and do it. You know, there, I want a button on the mobile app where when I'm when I'm uploading this thing, it'll go right to YouTube, my YouTube channel. And they did that too. They integrated that too around the first of the year. <clears throat> so that's did how all really? my yeah, that's how all my new episodes go right to YouTube. Bam! As soon as I upload the episode, See, man, I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm a lot lazier about that uh, <laughs> uh, promotional stuff than you are. I mean, you know, you're good at it to your benefit. You know, you're. Gosh, the long gum has blown up a hundred thousand, you know, and I just, uh, dude, that's crazy. I, yeah. I'd rather go, you know, cause I, I'd be on Spreaker and look, there's, there's not many shows on Spreaker that are, have a hundred thousand listens. I mean, there's just not, if you go looking around Spreaker at people's shows, yeah. there's not many that I, have that many listens. And you know, no, you, I was amazed at, um, when we first got, got into the, 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 the whole Spreaker community, how many shows there are, they get like, three, four, 16 listens a month. Yeah. Um, and people just keep churning the episodes out, man, because it, it is fun podcasting. If you, if you're podcasting about a subject that you're passionate about, it is a tremendous amount of fun. And to me, I think that's where the buzz is, is, you know, just, just being doing what I do for a living, you know, it's kind of a creative, it's just another creative outlet. 
Right. For me, from like we were talking about, you know, sort of outlining what you're going to talk about and figuring out what, and arranging your info, and then there's the whole creative process of actually going into the speaker, speaker system and producing and mixing the episode. And once they go up, they're there forever, you know? Yeah. Um, nobody can take that away from you. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, I enjoy the hell out of it. It's it's when uh, it's, it's it's when the, the drama seekers pop up. <laughs> uh, you know um, that uh, it, it, the fun goes out of it sometimes. Yeah, and, and the amount of when, from we started, you know, it was okay. Here's Black Op Radio, and that was pretty much the only choice you had. And now you got my show, you got Doug's show, you got Chuck's show, you got, uh, what's that dude up in Canada? Brent Holland's show. You got Bob Wilson's show. You got yeah. Al Warren doing stuff related to the assassination. I mean, it's, it's you all know, over the place. Oh yeah. You know, and speaking of, of, of there being a lot of, uh, a lot of shows now, um, I'm going to, for, for people that uh, listen to the Dallas Action, or if you haven't yet, if you are if you listen to Rob's show and you want to check out our show, I'm going to try to get two more episodes up in the month of October. And then um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a vacation for the entire month of November, Rob. Yeah. You know why? Why? <laughs> Dude, it's because every terrestrial... And internet radio show on the planet, like even the ones that talk about the Nephilim and the lizard people that run the Federal Reserve, and uh, <laughs> George Norrie uh, will be talking about the JFK. Yeah, you yes. know, um, even the people that, um, that that regularly do radio shows about alien abduction are going to be doing their JFK stuff in November. Oh yeah. Uh, and I've just, you know, I've just decided ah, I'm going to take a vacation from that cacophony. Um, I'll just come back with some fresh material in December. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But tell you what I would be, Rob, we would be remiss if we didn't remind you, the listeners where they can find the Dallas section. Yeah, let's let them know for sure. Because there's a bunch of yeah. places they can find it. There's a bunch. The best place to find it is right at the source, ladies and gentlemen, and that is Spreaker.com. And if you'll give me just a moment to navigate my electronic mobile device here, I'll yeah, give you the link. It's the Dallas X Podcast. Here, I got it. Okay. Yeah. What do you got? You got it? I don't have it. I was nope. just going to say, if you, if you can't remember the specific link, because I think you got some numbers and letters in there. All yeah, you gotta do, it does. all you got to do is search for Dallas Action when you get to Spreaker, and it will pop right up. Pop right up, pop exactly right up. It's Spreaker www dot Spreaker s p r e a k e r dot com slash user slash seven three three eight nine five three. That's Spreaker dot com slash user slash seven three. Three eight nine five three is the direct link, but if you go to the Dallas Action on Facebook, we have a Facebook page, and there's a post with that link. You can click right over for every single episode. Also, me and Rob's shared Facebook page, which is the JFK Assassination Dash Two Two November Network. That's the digits two two November Network, all one word on Facebook. Also, the Dallas Action. All the posts and links can be found on our blog spot, our WordPress site, two two November Network dot WordPress dot com. We are also at the Dallas Action, and when I say we, I mean the royal we. It's just me. Um, our uh, proud members of the Wicked Radio Network the Tangent Bound Podcast Network, uh, the Stitcher Network, and the Satchel Player for Podcast app. We're featured on all that stuff. There's 95 episodes. No, wait. A few have been deleted. There have been 95. There are still 80 in the archives. Actually, oh, and, and Ed, Doug, uh, Doug, yeah. Rush LaChapelle would like those episodes that you've deleted, by the way. <laughs> Man, I don't know what to tell you. I really don't. I, I really know. don't. I'm just, just busting your balls. 
Yeah, yeah. And some of the things we've covered recently, we did, uh, of course, the one this week, uh, Part 95, The Strange Tale of Robert Croft and other D.D. Plaza stories. Had Michael Best on a couple of times recently, the uh, counterintelligence expert and uh, declassified documents archivist from Glomar Disclosure. Um, had uh, Mr. Larry Hancock on uh, a couple of times this year. Uh, talking about the Gunboat Cowboys, Roy Hargraves, uh, Hemming, and the Interpin Mercenaries. A uh, couple of episodes about Army Intelligence, uh, the Dallas uh, the Dallas Police Department, and uh, one uh, from June 10th, 2016, called The Bannister Network, with special guest Rob Clark is in the archive. Yeah. That is number... 88, and that is one for the ages, ladies and gentlemen. Please go check. Please go check all of those out. If you are a fan of the Lone Gunman podcast, which I know you are, as am I, uh, this is the brother show to the Lone Gunman podcast. We are Doc and Wyatt. We ride together. It's the Dallas Action. Check us out. Big archives. Lots of cool stuff to hear. Yeah, and and you know what was really cool is is listener Carolyn sent us cool ass coffee mugs with our There's logos only in the world. Tell tell everybody about these awesome mugs. Man. Well, there's three of them because she has one. Um, yeah, she yeah, three in the whole world. She got us these custom made Lone Gummin and Dallas Action coffee mugs, and it has a logo on the front. And then on the back, it has the government corruption response team. Cool as shit. And thank you, Carolyn, so much. I, you know, I, I can't speak for Doug, but I'm sure he loves it too, as much as I do. So thank you very much. It, it is, it is indeed my favorite mug. And you know what, Miss Carolyn has been, um, uh, she has been down from day one. Yeah, with long time podcast. supporter. And in, all, day in, the, one. in all seriousness, God bless Russ. I mean, he, he does archive our shows. If anything ever happens to Spreaker, if a nuclear yep. bomb goes off in Spreaker headquarters, Russ will have all the shows. So exactly. uh, yeah. God bless him if for doing are, what he we does. Are, we are preserved in perpetuity, thanks to Mr. LaChapelle. Yes. Um, and Miss Carolyn, she... Uh, if, if anybody's ever listened to my show and I mention, you know, a certain listener like Rob or I might mention Ted Rubenstein, I might mention Francesca, Akhtar, or Miss Carolyn, and I'll say member of the Dallas Action Honor Roll, right? Um, and but that, I, that phrase was, was actually invented for Miss Carolyn a couple of years ago. She was the very yeah. first member. And that coffee mug is my, it's, it, it immediately became my favorite coffee mug in the world. Because it says, Real big, it's got the TLG, a red TLG and a blue TDA, the Dallas Action. Um, and uh, that's a cool logo. And, and I like the Government Corruption Response Team. That's that's the three of us. Yeah. Only three. Only three. It's an exclusive damn club, Rob and Miss Carolyn. It is. And I might as well plug the hell out of this right now. If anybody out there is interested in a... Lone Gummin or Dallas Action t-shirt. We yeah. have yeah. a shit ton of designs for you to choose from. Unfortunately, we don't have a link where I can send you directly to our whole store. I'm going to bug them about getting that done. Uh, but there are pictures. <laughs> of, yeah, there get are, on them. Yeah, there, there are pictures up over at the Lone Gummin Facebook page of all the different designs. And if you see one you like, let me know and I can send you the direct link where you can purchase this. Now, when you purchase this T-shirt, we get a very small percentage of of a kickback when it hits a uh, hundred dollars or something. They only pay out every hundred dollars, um, so it's going to take us a while to get a payout. Um, and 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 when we do, you know that that will go to help support the show. And Doug, I believe, is going to donate his to the uh, St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Every penny. If if people buy uh buy a shirt every every penny, uh I'm gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna contact them. My wife does uh, like a walkathon uh, kind of thing for St. Jude's every spring. So we're gonna we're gonna get the royal treatment. We're gonna ride down to Memphis, which is only about three hours away, and we'll get a picture uh with them with one of those big chicks, you know? It's St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Um 
and it's gonna we're gonna donate every penny um, to to them on behalf of the Dallas Action family, the Long Gunman Podcast family, and the JFK Assassination Research Community. And I'm gonna make sure they put that on their fake big check. Yes. Because and not me giving them the money, it's it's everybody else. So that's what I'm going to do. Yes, yes, we have a lot of cool shirts. We have a lot of offensive shirts. Um, <laughs> well, so, you said a while ago, you know, you said there's a bunch of shirts. It's not the quality, ladies and gentlemen. It's the it's it's not the quantity. It's the quality. Where yes. you can get a you can get a Lone Gunman podcast shirt with Larry Crayford's mug on it. Yes. Where you can get an Oswald. Uh, Shit, and what was it? I I have a shirt with Fetzer and Senke on it, and it says, "I'm gonna have to pull this up and see." I mean, you can get a, I you know, I got a good sense. You of really make a Fetzer Senke? You're really selling Fetzer Senke shirts? Yes, sir, I am, and it, it's very oh. funny. You know, so if you want to oh, piss off, if you want to piss off some people, I will. If you want to, if you hey, want to piss off some people guys, in Dallas, yeah, yeah. If you want to make some people in Dallas. There's there's a there's a there's a there's a, a Dallas action the Dallas action T-shirt it's the uh, Lee Harvey Oswald backyard photo but instead of a rifle he's holding a flying V electric guitar <laughs> with flames painted on it. Um, Dime bag there has to be uh, exact. Yeah, we we've got uh, there's the, uh, the the Dallas action Lauren Hall. Uh, yes, uh, that that may be my favorite. Uh, Lauren, Lauren Blue. Hall. Yes, yes, with a cigar. Um, smiling real big, and it says the Dallas action. Uh, some uh, quite a lot of very very cool T-shirts over there. I myself am about to get uh, 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 get me a long gun podcast with um, the sketch of dark complected man and radio man sitting on the curb. Rob, I like that design a lot. TLG podcast. Yeah, that's an awesome design. And you know, I got uh, I got one with uh, David Atley Phillips on it, with a, standing in front of a CIA sign. I got. And Oswald is prayer man shirt for Bart and, and and all those guys and I even got. Hey, you telling me that we can we can literally you can literally put like an uh, unlimited number amount of designs up there for sale for the for TLG and 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 the Dallas Action. I can put anything on here, dude. Anything. And I found the Jim Fetzer and Ralph K one. It, it is them standing side by side. Ralph is wearing a dress, of course, and Fetzer has his arm around him, and it says OIC Obesity. In sync, get it? Do you get oh, it? Oh, Rob, I can't take you anywhere. <laughs> it is the funniest shirt in the world. Oh. So you know, I'm thinking about making you a Judy what? Baker yeah, shirt. What? <laughs> yeah, what? If 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 I was your mother, I, I would. Did she have to like have you on one of those retractable leash harnesses when you were a child to keep you out of trouble? No, I think that's the problem. I'm off the chain, buddy. Ah. Uh. Yeah, no, I didn't have the I didn't have the harness, but I did have the helmet. <laughs> but yeah, the, folks, there's a ton of cool designs. You can get one with with Doug's big ugly mug on it that says the Dallas Action. You can get one with my That's big right. ugly mug That's on right. it that says the Lone Gunman Podcast. You can get one with Lee Harvey Oswald that says Keep Calm and Patsy on. You got one with uh, Lawrence hey, Howard, yeah, Lauren Hall, here. Roy Hargraves, and Vidal with Squad Goals. Um, God, guys, I gotta, I gotta tell you, if you, uh, if you get you one of those, uh, get you one of those, uh, lone gunmen, uh, with, uh, Rob's picture on it and, uh, you know, wear it around your girl all day. It'll pay off later. <laughs> I can't believe I made that shirt. Unbelievable. Oh, I think it's fantastic. The, think it's fantastic. The, That's what inspired me to make the, 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 the Doug Zilla Dallas action shirt. Yeah. I mean, but that Larry Crazy yeah. shirt, that's, uh. I actually ordered that shirt. I have that shirt. Um, I know. I saw your you you you. I saw your photograph with that shirt on. And for those worried about the quality of these shirts, look, I'm actually wearing one right now. It's the Lone Gunman uh, logo shirt, and I love. It's really soft, Doug. I mean, this the quality is good. The build is good on these shirts. Uh, the only problem I would say is order a size bigger than you normally wear. Okay. Okay. That's what I would. That's what I would tell everyone. I mean, you can order these in women's cut T-shirts. You can order them in hoodie style. You can order them in long sleeve, short sleeve T-shirts. Any design you want. 
Uh, just let me know. Any design you want. Yeah, just yeah. you know, get at me on Facebook or Twitter. Say, hey, you know, I want this, and I'll send you a link for it. Um, supposedly, I'm supposed to get a notification when we sell a shirt, but I haven't got any yet, so I don't know exactly what's going on, or if we're even selling any shirts, or if I'm the only one that's bought any yet. I don't know. But uh, hopefully, this works. I've had a lot of people. <laughs> I've had I've had some interesting I've had, people. I've had many people tell me that they were excellent, excellent looking shirts, and they can't wait to have one. But I do not I have not had any confirmation of a purchase. Yes. That's right. You know. So, folks. No, I have not heard. Nobody's told me. If you have, if anybody out there has, in fact, purchased a Dallas Action shirt, post a photo at the Dallas Action on Facebook, and I will post it for everybody to see that you have uh, donated to the cause. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will even mention you on the show. So, you post a picture you wearing the Lone Gummin or TDA shirt. We will definitely mention you on the show and thank you publicly for your contribution and support for the show. And I'm wearing, like I said, I'm wearing the shirt right now and it's, it's comfortable. I've washed it once. It hasn't faded at all. It didn't shrink actually, which is a good thing because it's a hundred percent cotton. So hopefully they're pre shrunk. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a comfortable shirt. It's nice and soft and you know, it shows off the guns pretty good. You know, it hugs the guns, you know, on your upper arm. There you it. go. I love it. Sun's out, guns out, baby. Boom, boom. The lone gunman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. All right. We better end this uh, while we're The Dallas we're action. Hey, we're eating tacos. The Dallas action. <laughs> yeah, we can make any offensive shirt if you want to wear one to Dallas this year. This, you know, has Judy Baker's big face on it and. You know, her having sex with Lee Oswald or something. We can make that shirt. You know, we can. Oh we can no! That. You have to go oh. there. You have to go there. <laughs> you have to go there. Uh, yeah. Now, now I'm trying to clean my brain. I'm thinking about sandpaper just to make it go away. I know. I apologize. Yeah. So, dang it, Rob! I again, know. can't take you to anyone. <laughs> All right, man. We plugged everything. You know where to find the show. You know where to listen to the show. You know how to support the show. And. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for getting us this far. Here we are, two and a half years later, a hundred thousand yep. downloads later. Uh, yep. you know, we're we're still in this thing together, brothers from another mother. You know what I'm saying? Bros before hoes and all that good stuff. And uh, <laughs> yeah, still, there you go. There you go. You know, I, hopefully you oh. learned something today. Uh, well, you know, if not, at least you see the reasoning behind where we're coming from on a lot of these issues, even if you don't agree with us, that's fine. But just take into consideration all angles of something before you fully invest your support and, and remain objective, remain open-minded to evidence that could change your way of thinking. That's, that's, that's the main I, thing I would here. say we're not, unlike many out there, we're not... Uh, promoting a certain theory, either one of us, we're not trying to bully anybody into accepting any theories, either one of them. If you boil it all down, I think what we do is ask questions. And that's, that's what we do. We ask questions. Why do we think this? Why is this this way? How did they get there? How, you know, what were their motivations? And it's, it's just, uh, and you're gonna when you question quote unquote conventional thinking, you're gonna step on some toes, and and that's that's all we're doing is questioning things, because chasing the same leads for fifty three years has led us right back to where we've always been. Yep. Right. That's right. And and you know it's I don't even know how to say it properly, but you know looking at all this stuff and and. and what I'm saying is we, we, need to, we need to have a higher evidentiary threshold when it comes to this case. Because if you think just because you're on the conspiracy side of things that everybody else on the conspiracy side of things is going to listen to you and believe in what you're saying and buy what you're saying and promote what you're saying, that's not a good thing. Because all you're doing is you're making – if you think it's easy for us to tear you down – what do you think the lone nutters in the mainstream media would do if they got a hold of, you know, all this stuff 
as a whole. You know, all these dummies think Oswald's in the doorway. <laughs> That's a joke. You know, this is ridiculous. We've hired a photo expert that clearly states that this photo has not been altered in any way. You know, it's not easy to tear down horrible theories or fairy tales. You know, have you, has Judy Baker been on the mainstream media? No. There's a reason for that. Because they were tearing apart in two seconds and make us all the laughing stocks. You know, all us crazy conspiracy theorists. You know, we get lumped right along inside Beverly Oliver and Judith Baker and James Files. You know, because people on the outside without an interest in this case, when they look at us, they see conspiracy theorists and they see, you know, lone nutters. That's all they see. We're all the same to them, even though we're not. Um, and I don't like being lumped in with, with all this other stuff. And just well, the problem is it's, it's, it's a matter of it's, 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 it's a matter of public recognition is a matter of volume. You know, most people that are serious students who do serious, well-informed analysis on the subject tend to do so quietly, the more serious people. And the ones that are the most vocal, um, the ones that do the most shouting are usually the ones that want the attention, and the ones that want the attention want it for not because they're serious students, but it's because they want attention. Yeah, and and they and they tend to be the uh, uh, the the more fringe, and if the more fringe are the louder of the two, then obviously they're the ones that are going to get the most attention to the mainstream. Yeah, a la the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You know, like we were talking yeah, about uh, yeah. Caulfield's book and earlier. That's how right? we all get lumped in together. You know, people yeah. that are vaguely aware of, say, the community, and, and and if they dip their toe in it, the first thing they come across is the OIC, and they go, oh, God, all these people are crazy. And that's how it works. Yep. You know, and meanwhile, someone like you or me or – you know, people that we know that are more reasonable, educated people who are on our side of the fence. That oh, you're one of those crazy, you know. And, but unfortunately, that's the way it works. Yeah, you know? and, and you notice, like we were talking about Caulfield's book, you notice that book did not get any attention from the mainstream media whatsoever. It didn't get any ref refutation or it didn't get talked about by any lone nutters whatsoever. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that he did his homework and it's based on documentation and evidence. There's very little speculation in that book. It's this can be tied to this because of this document. This can be tied because of that document. It's very hard to refute evidence. It's very easy to refute stories. Yeah. 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 And that's what and, we got to uh, remember. But like I say, you know, that was a point of uh, one of the one of the points at the end of the last episode of the Dallas action was, you know, it's discerning between the two. There's the challenge, you know. Yeah, and and there's, it's not just them. There's a lot of little stories that you know you you got to choose. You know, okay, well, can this be substantiated by anything else? Can this be proven? Cause it, or is this just a fairy tale? Is this somebody's story that you know wants to insert themselves into the middle of things? You know. And that is a big problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. What you got to look for is the people that are trying to extricate themselves from the story. <laughs> those, those, are the, those are the leads you want to say, hey, why are you running away? Exactly. You know, like, come here. Come here. Come here, you. You know, that's what we need to be concentrating on, not, not the people that uh, whose story becomes ever more fanciful each time it's told, Madeline Brown, you know. Yeah, Beverly Oliver. Uh, Judith Baker, um, you know, and on and well, on down the say, list. You know, she, that, that could have been her. All I know is that uh, the Knicks film thing, that, that, that does it for me. You know, it's like, hey, do your thing. We'll see you. Yeah, and the claims inside the Carousel Club and her being best best friends with Jack Ruby. and I mean, come on. But anyway, we digress, and uh, we've said what we had to say, and Doug... Once again, magnificent show, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on and celebrating these hundred some thousand downloads and plays, brother. Anytime, any, 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 any time, I will come running to be on the Long Gunman podcast. Absolutely. I know. At this rate, no we'll doubt. be doing no 200,000 in like three months. 
<laughs> yeah, well, we'll do it again, and we'll uh, 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 you'll you'll goad me into picking on someone else. Yeah, I'll have to find some more shit for you to talk next time. <laughs> Rob, he he's tough, man. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! <laughs> I like bringing out uh, the other side. This is this is the yeah, this is the dark know, side of the Dallas it. action. Oh man, I know somebody. Yeah, I, I tell you about the email I got the other day. Some guy, some guy sent me an email. And he, goes, he was mad about something I said about Dulles, I think. And he, 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 the last, the last line was, "How did you get a podcast anyway?" So I answered him. It was an essay contest. I finished seventh. <laughs> how did you get a podcast? Oh, how did you, I don't know. How did I get one, Doug? I downloaded a free app. Yeah, there it was. Yeah, anybody and their brother can do this shit, but it takes a special breed to do it consistently and qualitatively, if that's even a word, for two and a half years. Here we go. Baby. I think it is now. You just made it a word. And we're going to yeah. keep going. <laughs> yeah, we'll, yep. let's brush right over that in my linguistic skills and just thank everybody for listening. And look, head over to tlgpodcast.com for more. You can also listen to the latest episode of the Dallas Action on TLG Podcast. Just click the link in the tab. That's all you got to do. It'll open up a little player right, and you can listen it. to the latest episode. But for all the remember, episodes. Remember, guys. Yeah. Remember. Remember when you're, you know, less arguing. Um, when you do like Rob would do uh, with this material, you need to thinkify more. Brain of the cake. That's what you need to do. <laughs> What are you trying to say? I'm like, W? Liberty Lobby. <laughs> Don't make me say it. Liberty Lobby. I'm not. There you go. You did it again. All, All right. right. My phone's speaking, Bob. Talk us out. All right, people. Blue like Mary. I said, TLGpodcast.com for more. Listen. Share the show. We love you. Till next time. Thank you, Doug. You're welcome, sir. Some bitches in the can beaming up the satellite down directly to your ears, people. This is your boy and your other boy. Peace.